just so you know, occasionally you'll see this drawn the other way. So like, um, sort of the opposite way, right? So remember this is like a, it's like a hex hexagon on the end. Sometimes you'll see it drawn the other way. And it doesn't really matter which way you draw it. I mean, I took this from Wikipedia, so this is, I don't want to redraw the figure, so this is the way it is. But all, all that, all, all that, the only difference is the sign convention, again, right? So all you have to know is that this, this cone opens up, I mean, it, it opens, right? It opens in the direction of compression. Because what this is saying is, is if, if I, well, well, my, the original figure, let me clear off my drawing. So what this is saying is that, remember this is a line, the, the line that it's centered around is the line sigma one equals sigma two equals sigma three. So that's sort of the representation of hydrostatic. So if I move along this line in this direction, I'm increasing the pressure, I'm in increasing the hydrostatic confinement. And so that's, that's uh, basically how much I'm squeezing the rock, right? And so in that, in that case, this is opening in the direction of positive compression. So if you see it the other way, it's just the sign convention is flipped, okay? But remember, out here is tension. And rocks are very weak in tension. So that's why the cone closes off. Right? So where it, it gets bigger in this direction, it you know, because rocks get stronger in compression. That's how you can remember it, right? I think everybody, everybody knows intuitively a rock is weak in tension, but very strong in compression, right? So the surface gets larger in compression, weaker in tension. Okay. So we talked about this on Friday, but what this model implies, because this gets larger in compression, and what this implies is that no matter how much I compress it, remember if I'm inside the cone, if I'm inside the cone, I'm elastic. I only fail when I hit the surface of it, and I can't be outside of it, right? So while I'm in the middle, I'm elastic. So what this implies is that as I increase the pressure, on to infinity, I'm always going to be in the cone. I'm always going to be elastic, right? And so if I squeeze a rock, no matter how hard I squeeze it, according to this model, when I let it go, it'll spring back to its original undeformed shape, okay? And of course, we probably, you know, with intuition, you, you probably know this can't be true because rocks have pores in them. And if I squeeze it hard enough, eventually I'm going to collapse those, collapse those pores permanently. And when I let it go, they won't recover. I will have permanently squeezed out some of the porosity of the material. Okay? And so to have a model that can reproduce that type of behavior, this, this cone cannot be open to infinity. There has to be some type of cap out there some type of cap on it, so, some type of cap. And so these types of models that have a cap on them are called cap models or in cap models. Right? So whenever you hear somebody say cap or in cap, that's what they're talking about is that there's, there's some cap on the amount of pressure, hydrostatic pressure I can put on the rock while, while it will remain elastic. And so the data, the data corroborates this. So this is, uh, this is some sandstone or, or several different types of sandstone. All, the, all of the different dots represent different types of sandstone, but they're all sandstones. And this is a plot on the x-axis is essentially the mean pressure, the hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so it's like the sum of the, sum of the principal stresses, SH min, SH max, that's vertical divided by three. So the average amount of pressure, and then it's the effective stress, so they're subtracting off the pore pressure. All right, so this is pressure, increasing pressure along this axis. And this is essentially a measure of shear, 
And so what you see here, all this data that stacks up along this line is shear failure, right? So this is essentially the Moore envelope, okay? But what you see here is now as a function of pressure, the data stacks up along these sort of elliptical lines, and what those represent are permanent porosity loss. And so there's even some numbers there. So this, you know, down here, this is like 35% porosity, 23%, 20, so 15. So the porosity is being squeezed out. It was originally 35% porosity is now 15 out here. So I've permanently squeezed out the porosity. And so now your failure envelope, again, you know, if you're, if you're inside here, you're elastic. If I'm out here, if, if, I, if, I, if I increase, if I increase the shear stress, eventually I hit <laughs> the more failure envelope, the shear strength, and in that case I fail the rock. Or, but if I increase the pressure, I'm permanently squeezing out porosity so that when I release the pressure, the rock is permanently deformed. Okay? And of course this has implications in petroleum e engineering, right? We, when we squeeze out the porosity, the, 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 the porosity is co connected to the permeability, right? And so we, we affect the filtration properties of the rock when we permanently squeeze it out. And this can happen, um, you know, this can happen through depletion over time. So as you're depleting the reservoir, the pore pressure is dropping, uh, the vertical stress essentially stays the same, and you, be, you get into a regime where, you know, Initially, the vertical stress helps you in that it's squeezing the pores like a sponge, and you can produce more, up to the point where you start to reach some of these failure li limits. And now you've squeezed out so much that you're going you're gonna to actually permanently deform the rock and squeeze out the porosity, and then that, of course, hurts you. So you can get compaction drive from depletion, which is beneficial for some time, and then, and then later it can hurt you. So what starts off good can be bad in the end. We'll talk more about depletion later in the class. So a model, uh, I guess what I wanted to point out with this is that if you notice, the way the data stacks up out here is sort of along these ellipses, right? If you draw, if you draw these lines, they sort of look like ellipses. You know, if you, were, if you were to continue them, it's like a partial ellipse, right? Elliptic arc, if you will, the way it's drawn here. But if you were to continue them over, then you could model that as, a fun, as a, an equation of ellipse. And so then one popular model to, to do this is called the Cam Clay model. And so if you look up here, uh, this is nothing more than essentially the equation of ellipse. Uh, P is your mean stress, your mean effective stress. So the the sigmas there are effective stress measures. And then this Q, this essentially is, um, this is something like that's like the 3 times J2. So J2 is the second invariant. J2 is the second invariant of the deviatoric stress. We talked about the deviatoric stress a little bit when we derived BO's coefficient, but the deviatoric stress is like the total stress minus the mean stress, so one-third the trace of S times I. So these are tensors, or three-by-three three matrices, you can think of them. So the deviatoric stress is like, it's, it's like a measure of the shear stress of the material. So it's the total stress minus the isotropic part or the hydrostatic part. And then you take the second invariant of that. The second invariant of that gives you J2, and that, that's what it's equal to. Okay. Actually, I think now that I'm looking at it, there's no 3 there. It's just J2. It's just J2. And so then M is just the ratio of those two, and you put them in there, and you get the equation of ellipse.
So this would be the shear failure, M, and then these were the ellipses that are fit via the cam clay model. And these are the different, <coughs> one, two, three represent the different loading paths. So one would just be a straight hydrostatic test, You're just squeezing the rock, right? A, a triaxial compression test would take you uh, along this loading path. So you're squeezing the rock and at the same time applying an axial load. And then a, a triaxial extension test would take you along this line. Right, line. And so remember, triaxial extension is kind of a funny test because we actually compress it first. And we don't, we don't actually pull on it. We compress it first. And then we release the axial load. So you might call it like triaxial uncompression. <laughs> We, we squeeze it first, then we release. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's an infinite number of models. Uh, there's also an infinite <laughs> amount of complexity you can put into the model. And this model right here sort of has everything that we talked about. Okay. So, this is uh, originally this was known as the Sandia Geo model. It was originally developed by this guy right here, Arlo Fossum. He worked at Sandia for quite a while, uh, but and then went to BP and then uh, retired from BP a few years ago. Uh, now the the model has sort of been, uh, in terms of you know, I mean the model is just a theoret it's just equations, right? It's a theory, it's just a theoretical th framework. But associated with this model, because it's so complex. The authors of the model also distribute the Fortran code to you know, solve this model or, or do a return algorithm for this model. And so the maintainer of that now is currently this lady, Rebecca Brannon, who also was at Sandia at the time, but now is a professor at the University of Utah. And, uh, so this is a model you can actually, if, you wanna, if you're interested in using it, you could get it from uh, Dr. Brannon. And anyway, this model has like, you know, whereas the Moore Coulomb model had two fitting parameters, right? This model has like 68, which means to fully populate it, you have to go to the lab and do 68 independent tests, which no one's ever going to do. Right? Thankfully, you don't have to use all of the complexity at once. So this model has rate dependence and you know, so you can do high strain rate stuff. You can do creep. You can, you know, it, it's very, very complex. Um, but also, you can see it has some of the features of other things we've talked about, in that it has a cap, right? So this is that meroidal view, or this is a measure of pressure here, and a measure of shear stress there. So this is a cap on the model, and the cap can be pushed out as a function of work hardening. So as I as I push the cap out, you know, we, we're permanently deforming it. The cap moves out. Okay. Uh, this is that pi plane view. So remember, the uh, Moore Coulomb had a shape like this. And we talked a little bit on Friday about return algorithms and other things. Remember. Uh, you know, you can't be outside the yield surface, and so in a computational setting, if you find yourself outside the yield surface, you have to return yourself to the yield surface. And so the, the, the more Coulomb model can cause problems in that setting, whereas this model has smooth sides. So, um, by the way, th this is really a generalized model because by turning off different parameters, you know, like I said, there's 68 total or something, but if I set half of them to zero or or 68 of them to zero, I can actually recover the Moore Coulomb model exactly. So it's a real generalized framework. It, it encompasses a lot of the other ones. Um, you can also, the yield surface can grow. It can grow in space like this as a function of work hardening. It can also shift around in stress space. So instead of just growing, it can, it can move around. So it can actually move around off of that. Normally, normally the yield surface is centered Normally, it's centered on sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. It could actually shift and be where it was not centered on that. That's called 
kinematic hardening. So that induces anisotropy. And that's actually a really um, common thing in rocks, is that you can get deformation-induced anisotropy. So as I'm deforming it, then it becomes more and more anisotropic. Okay. So, I, you know, we're certainly not going to do anything with this model, but this is sort of probably the most complex constituent model for geomaterials that I've ever encountered. Uh, and in, in that way, it's, it's very good. It can, it can fit all sorts of data, but it's also very slow when you use it in a computational code because it has so much complexity.